Hello, I'm the Bunny Man, and we are in the Eyes of Terror. Crazy Susie is currently still out with her back surgery. She's recovering very nicely. Uh, she should be back with us next week or next month. So it's still just me. Uh, so hooray for that, I guess. Um, so I'm trying my hardest without her being here. So if you like just me or you like us both together, uh, you know, you can message us or you could tell me to please stop doing this by myself because I'm not great at it. I don't know. We are in the process of doing some in reviews of independent films. So if you or somebody you know is an independent director and would like to have their film get out there, we already have two. Hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And we will be more than happy to view that video. Two stipulations either for this. Uh, one, we have to be able to watch it. So either it is available like on Amazon Prime or like YouTube or something like that, or you give us a physical copy for free. And then the other stipulation is that we're going to be really honest with what the movie is. You know, we don't expect you to pay for us. It's we're not giving you lip service, uh, but we will be. It'll be an honest critique of the films that we do watch. I do have a an ad about our stuff, so that'll be here. Thank you for listening to this labor of love. We hope you're enjoying this episode and continue to do so. Crazy Susie and I try to bring you a quality podcast. If you wish to help us out, we have a few ways to do so. We have a Patreon with a variety of perks that range from a dollar, and that goes up to 20. We also have your Redbubble and a Teespring merch store with a slew of shirt designs that range from t-shirts to hoodies, blankets, and pillows. We also do a stream on YouTube and Twitch and a variety of other platforms. That's every other Sunday a month at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please follow us on our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to keep up to date on what is going on with the streams, new merch releases, and just to see our daily lives. And finally, you can passively support us by listening to, listen to us on Radio Public, a free podcast catcher that pays the creators. We also appreciate all the likes, comments, and subscriptions you have given us. Thank you again, and enjoy the rest of this episode. And thank you for coming back. Uh, and you might be asking, what am I drinking? Well, I am drinking a Orange Boom Premier Lager Beer from Holland. I found this at Trader Joe's. And it was... It's been a step, it was a brewery established in 1671. So a bit of historical brewing. And I'll read the, the little bit of the thing on the back. Brewed with a passion as a tribute to the House of Orange, the orange tree crest symbolizing the family tree of the Dutch royal family, Orange Nassau, was introduced and the Orange Boom brand was born. Orange Boom is one of the Holland's oldest brands since we started shipping beer in 1899 to almost every corner of the world. Orange Boom has been appreciated for its refreshing, outstanding quality. It's very limited ingredients beer, too, which I do appreciate. So it's water, barley, malt, hops, and hop ex extract. It is 5% by volume. And, in, and the can is one pint or nine fluid ounces. It's a very, I would say, springy uh, summer brew. It's a, it's nice and light. It doesn't have a huge amount of flavor to it, but it's uh, it's it's enjoyable. Honestly, I'll be honest. I was sort of expecting a little bit of orange in there just because of the name, but. Uh, I'm not disappointed. So if you have a Trader Joe's ne near you uh, and you are of, of age, go out and try one for yourself. All right, tonight's movie is Ancient Evil Unbound, 2018. This movie is located on Amazon Prime. Prime. The length is one hour and 36 minutes. It is directed by Philip Gardner. It is starring Andrew Goy, Sarah Sarah Dunn, and Layla Randall Con Day Con Day. Um and it has no IMBD. 
but it does have a score on Amazon and it's 2.6 out of 10. So yeah, my point has been trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel of horror that usually will make Crazy Susie's head explode. Um, she can only take so much bad and I have a high tolerance for bad. So uh, this one, I'm, I'll be honest, sort of... Uh, sort of almost got me to the point of turning this off I'll be honest uh, so let's get into it and we'll see why all right the film starts out as a documentary you know like old great films and one guy and they have like a series of experts quote unquote uh, sort of like an ancient alien style documentary type thing uh, one guy is going on that that it was believed that meteoroids were a magic object that was considered to have real power. And if somebody crafted a knife or a sword out of the meteorite, they had the power of possessing the soul and imprisoning it in the meteorite. Uh, then we have an Egyptologist say that ancient Egypts believe evil was all around us, and they protected themselves with precious stones. And then we go into a few other people who are basically like new aged experts, quote unquote, saying that stones that are wrongly used not only damage the, the, the person that is using it, but also all of mankind. And I've studied some of the stone stuff. I have friends who really believe in stone magic. I'm not a huge believer in stone magic. That's just me. Uh... I think some of them do have, I guess, practical power if you believe enough in it. But I'm, I'm not. I don't wear stones or anything like that. And um, I have never heard somebody say that if you use a stone wrong, it's going to damage all of mankind. Because if that is true, then there will be irreparable damage to mankind because of all the people have used stones you know everybody has a different interpretation of what stone you should use and on what day and even goes on to like what time of day I, I've heard of that before no one really knows uh, what you know the lineage of stone usage was in my opinion yes there are precious stones used in Egypt and other cultures but I mean, we don't know what they used them for, let's say. Because there's been nothing written down, really, uh, about the exact belief structure that, that I know of. And I could be completely wrong in speaking on my buttocks. And supposedly the stones, to, to go on with the documentary, they say that supposedly the stones are used to gain people's souls or, like I said, imprison them or protect them. And it's just sort of it's cylindrical thinking, basically. Then we go into the credits and we see the spooky house slash estate. Um, it's your typical uh, estate in England. Uh, this one's abandoned, um, or a part of the wing is abandoned because that's not uncommon for some estates to be either uh, completely abandoned or parts of it because they just never were able to rebuild it or it just costs too much. Or they just don't want to have anything to do with that wing. Um, I don't know. The music is very generic and lame. and it, But it sets the tone of this movie to almost a T. <laughs> then we have a narrator. And he says, <clears throat> In the days of dark and light, before man banded together against one another, there were the elements older than time itself. They being the true spirits of earth, the man believes himself to be as God, and the world created became divided. No longer was a place for the spirits. No longer did man pay reverence to the earth. But lo, the spirits indeed remained waiting and watching, long forgotten but not erased. Okay, nice narration. Just, I really didn't feel like it had anything to do with this movie. Um, and we'll get that towards the end. 
And then we see some women walking around, and she's in that generic medieval wannabe dress with the huge sleeves that droop for on for days. Have you ever worn something that had that, that type of sleeves? They're highly impractical, especially if you like using your hands. Uh, if you don't like using your hands, they're great. But, you know, in my experience, they have been impractical and useless, and I don't think there's any record, historical record, of anybody wearing that. These people use their hands. So. Um, and then she joins up with a group of other robed people, and it looks to be some sort of ceremony is going on. Then they just walk off into the woods and continue into the countryside, and they keep walking and walking. The music becomes dramatic as they walk. They finally do something. So they gather around in the circle. There's a uh, something in the center. You don't know what it is. It's in some sort of parcel. And they dig a hole, and they put the parcel in the hole, and then they fill the hole back in, and they continue walking and walking, I imagine forever, as they walk somewhere. Um, then we see the abandoned manor, and all is abandoned glory. Then we have a woman in a robe saying, people stay away from here, because they know and respect the place. And it's been like that for a long time. Well, if the place was so respected and revered, and why is there a manor built on that location? So, a funny story is, is <clears throat> um, in the UK, there's these things called fairy mounds. And so, there was a, a work crew, and I forgot exactly where it was. Uh, I think it was actually outside of Brandon. Um, and this work crew was working on this road, and there was a, a ferry mound in the way. And they were going, you know, part of the the plan was to build a road right through the ferry mound. And the crew absolutely refused to uh, to do so out of fear of disturbing the fairies and going off. And, and folklore fairies are very uh, mischievous. Uh, they're not. You know, always the best intended. Um, so, instead of knocking down the ferry mound, they built the road around the ferry mound. So, there is, I mean, even to, to this day, there is still superstition strong in the people uh, in, in, in areas. I mean, I know living down where I live at in the south, there are places where you just don't go because of urban legend. Uh you know, every time we go past something, uh, this mausoleum, my daughter freaks out because supposedly there's blood on the side of it because of a girl. We've told her a billion times it's not, but, you know, she swears up and down there is. Next, the music gets a little chipper and country music-like, and we see a car rolling up, and it enters the manor's grounds. And the driver does not know where to park because we constantly see he parks in one area and then another and then parks in another. And he finally makes up his mind and parks off to the side of the manor. But this does establish the overall size of this English estate house. And I have to say the grounds for an abandoned place is uh, very well kept. So um, very manicured in my opinion. And then we see five people, plus gear, get out of this small Renault-like car. Basically, it's a clown car. European cars are small anyway. I cannot imagine having five people, plus gear, stuck inside of a car. Uh, I had several people inside of a, a Ford Neon one time, and I was uncomfortable. So, yeah, that was like four, four people in gear. And it was uncomfortable. Um, and then... Uh, as they get out of the car, they grab their tents, and we watch them set up their tents. Yeah. In all of his glory. Uh, 
So the direction must have been, let's set up a camera over here and uh, watch them not know how to set up tents for like five minutes. They sped it up though. They sped it up. And then the group goes inside of what's basically the main area and they have a touching spirit guide appreciation moment. And then the camera starts spinning for some reason, to just to be nauseating. So we get to see everybody in the group from, you know, the nose up or from, you know, their, the middle of their chest up. So we get to see their nice nostrils, some Blair Witch style stuff there. Then we watch them wandering around outside. And then I'm assuming that like later on that day, uh, the group goes inside of the main room and they're all like talking and stuff like that. And some random guy shows up behind him through a window. And the group is startled and we find out that the guy is uh, taking photos of the place because he's conveniently writing a book about the spooky things that go on there. We find out that the place is the most haunted place in England. How convenient. And that Lord Byron stayed there with Mary Chatsworth, and they wrote poetry. Yep, evil place. Evil, evil place. You never go to uh, a place where poetry has been written. That evil poetry. And then, of course, one of the girls gets a brilliant idea that they should make, try to make contact with Lord Byron. And then the author is like, well, I'm here. I just, I did my duty as... As being that random thing that you find either a book or a website that tells you something about the place. All right, I'm out of here. Uh, and he's like, but before I go, I have to tell you, remember this one, one line. It may save you forever. And he goes, to him, the book of night was open wide and voices from the deep abyss revealed a marvel and a secret and they're all like what does that even mean and he's like i don't know well i'm out bye after the guy leaves they break out into a song because it's tradition that they sing this one song uh and at every place that they go and this movie is a mixture between music video and not music video I think it's trying to be a documentary. I'm not quite sure. Slash music video. Then we see uh, as as this as basically top hat guy sings and plays the song. We see historical happenings of Lord Byron and Mary walking around the manor, talking. I'm assuming being jovial. Then the author goes into another area where it looks like there's signs that says. Do not enter, abandon, um, you have been warned. But we hear a voice that tells him to, Come to me, death awaits. Who could resist such an invitation? I mean, you might as well have said, we also have chocolate chip cookies at that point. Uh, but I know every time I say, come to me, or every time I hear, come to me, death awaits. I'm rushing right in there. Every time. And that's how I died. Then some apparition comes and attacks the man. We don't see really what happens. It just... He, we hear screams and basically a thud. The next morning, the band, cult, group of friends... I'm not quite sure what they are. Wakes up and climbs out of their tents. We watch them get dressed outside of their tents. Slowly. And they milled about doing it. I, I've, I've camped most of my life, and I can't. I don't ever remember a time of putting on, you know, going outside of my tent and putting on my clothes. I don't understand, you know, but these people are very comfortable with, you know, that entire group, and that's what they do. Okay. They might as well just got a huge tent. Then the guy dressed in ruffles and a vest, as we, we later find out his name is Alistair. He's such a vampire, you know, he reminds you of one of those vampire wannabes slash goth kids. 
He tells everyone to take in the place because we know a woman hung herself and Lord Byron lived here. That's the claim to fame. That Lord Byron lived there and somebody hung, hung, hung themselves. So that makes it the most haunted place in the UK. Okay. That makes sense. Then we have another song. As we watch the group wander about the estate, and now we take part in a a seance, which is a great idea. You want to do that in uh, haunted places. Uh, Great, great idea. And they call on the spirits to reveal themselves so they can help. Of course, Alistair uh, uses a whole bunch of mumbo-jumbo New Age speak. He comes across as a guy who, who basically did the bare essentials on studying up on things. And he's like, I'm going to create a group that does seances at haunted places or paranormal activity group. But I don't know what I'm actually doing. And then, of course, as he's saying this mumbo, this stream of words, then we get the telltale signs of a spirit has entered the area. We get a first person view of something rushing down a hallway as everything else goes blurry uh, beside it. And then one of the girls complains that she's chilled. And then we hear a random noise. And then the music escalates. All the tropes are here. Ooh, scary. Then they break the circle, which is another brilliant idea on their half. Because, you know, after you summon something, you want to make sure that they just, you know, get chilled there. Uh, you don't close it out or disband them from, you know, basically desummon them from that area. No, you just you just let them enter that area and just stay there. And then we have Tony, the camera guy, and the group wandering around some more. Then Tony asks about Lord Byron, who he was, and basically the simple answer was he was evil. He drank blood from a skull. He also did a lot of other things, uh, like write poetry and occult-type stuff. And if drinking blood from a skull makes you evil, well, count me in. Because I've done that. That's how I lost my pants. But Tony, the the good thing about Tony is he does make a point that he doesn't believe any of this stuff. He's just here to document uh, the group. So uh, the group, uh, and then we uh, we get to know more about uh, the group. We have more group circle time. I, I say we get to know the group. We know that they've been known each other for a while. And they look up to Alistair as some sort of like leader, but other than that, you don't really know if this is a band, a group of friends, a cult. And then, out of nowhere, we have another bloke that shows up, and we find out that it, that the group tries to help lost souls to find their way, and then the guy goes, so I hear that the chapel has a lot of paranormal activity. Well, toodaloo, I'm out. So basically he sets up that you should go to the chapel. Why not go to the chapel? There's a lot of spirits there. And he's, he's like, I'm from the town. Okay. And then the group is outside by their tents when they hear bang. And the old Russian to find absolutely nothing. Then they go back outside and the tents are all detented. The stakes are pulled. The poles are pulled. And they're laying flat. The nerve of the group starts basically changing they all start freaking out on what is going on alistair starts pointing fingers who did this i want to know who did this one of the girls spots something in the middle of a tent and we find that it's a dead bird and then uh, our fearless ruffled shirt leader tells the group that we won't back down because they are on a noble tra- they are part of a noble tradition that goes back before and is a part of christianity And then we have a magical history lesson about societies, guilds, and orders. We find out that they're all that they are a part of a death cult who whose goals is to save all souls that are stuck. I guess that's noble, isn't it? And then he continues to say, "This is dangerous work, and it's serious stuff, guys. It's not for fun. This is serious. No messing about." 
Well, honestly, I have studied stuff like this, and all they are doing is messing about. And the speech really didn't do anything to uh, to motivate me or the group. The, the group was basically like, well, okay, we won't be messing around, Dad. And then he's like, you know what? It's bedtime, everybody. Let's go to bed. And, the, and Alistair is like 45, and he's surrounded by like 20-somethings. And he's ordering them around like children. Next, we have Tony, the camera guy, going a long walk in the dark because he broke away from the group after that whole sort of like, uh, I guess, spiel because he just sort of had it with Alistair. Because it seems like they sort of like belittle him. They don't really care about him because he's not part of the crew. We have five minutes of Tony walking while music plays. Well, well into Tony's walk, he sees a random naked woman and he follows her. And she magically robes herself again in that dress from earlier. Uh, and then we see the group's tents and a voice beckons them to come to him, which one of the girls does in a nighty. She walks painfully slow to the section of the manor. She walks past Tony, who hides and watches as he strolls into the woods, we see the random bloke, the townie, and women in the robe hanging out together. And she gives him a knife, and he cuts off the nighty and lays her down. It is a, but it's really hard to make out what is going on because they decided to use a filter instead of actual night. And so it's like a mixture of blue and black, and that's it. And it's just really hard to make out anything. And I guess there's another group just chilling at another part of the manor. And we see them nakedly dance around the girl as they ether etherly chant. But it sounds like the audio is in a tube. Then we see Tony in the window. And dancing crew freak out. And the coven runs out of the room with old booby bouncing galore. It's one of the best parts of this movie. Tony confronts the head of the coven, which is some like baldy eye, and was like, "You're doing stupid. Why are you doing stupid witchcraft stuff?" And the man head coven guy says, "They weren't doing anything sinister. They were making a protection spell against the dark forces." Tony apologizes. I don't know. I just, I really don't feel like he had a lot of room to say because he's part of a group that believes that they can release lost souls um, from Earth or save their souls. Who will save your soul? Ah. Then he goes off and we see the spirit girl um, and then some more shots of the manor and some more generic music. Then we see the soul saving. Uh, then we see the soul saving squad, and their fluffy shirt leader Alistair. And he goes all wonky and stares off into space. And a ghostly voice emits from Alistair, proclaims, "I am here. Raise me from the pit." Of course, they ask, "Who are you?" And all we get is, "I am here." And then he points to the window. And then he proceeds to go over to the window and climbs and pulls at the, basically like the rungs of the window. Um, because it looks like it's a conveniently placed ladder, sort of. And Alistair climbs up it and then he collapses. And the blonde girl, Charlotte, tries to calmly, to calm him down, but she's panicking. Uh, which is not helping the situation. And he keeps pointing, and the camera pans to an ivy overgrown window, and we hear, I am. Next, we have a close up of Alistair, and some music about kissing away pain. And we watch Alistair drink and uh, stare, and drink some more from his flask, and he walks around. And this part feels more like a music video than anything else. Uh, I really don't know what's going on, and it's really like boring. It's, it's an unnecessary part of this movie. As long as this part was, I we get it that he is 
probably an alcoholic uh, or he's letting his guard down or whatever. Which is not something you do when you're being uh, abused by spirits. After that interesting scene, we see Alistair, Charlotte, and Tony outside of their tents. Then we get a view of one of the girl's thonged buttocks as she lays next to the top head hat guy. And we have... And we see that some creepy crawlers have invaded their personal space. We see a few grubs, a tarantula, because we all know that tarantulas are part are native to England. A few flies crawling across their bodies. We find out the thonged girl is name is Helena, and uh, the top hat guy's name is Craig. And they r- get up and rush out of their tent, screaming. And uh, Charlotte comes over and. Uh, Helps dress Helena and gives her a hug afterwards. As and then we see the other, the, basically the coven leader. Uh, he comes and looks upon the group, and he laughs. And Tony goes after him, and of course, so then Tony goes after the coven guy. Helena's getting dressed, and then we the next scene we see Charlotte finds it needs to go to the toilet, and she finds one conveniently in a alcove. And she gets ready to do her business as she sees a girl rocking back and forth right next to the toilet. And mind you, it's like an overgrown grassy area. It's not like a bathroom or a restroom. Um, And then as Charlotte is like, are you okay? What's going on? Or just gets close to her. the, The rocking girl turns around and screams at her. And then she vanishes. Well, Charlotte doesn't need the toilet anymore, now does she? Uh, so instead, she uh, goes to where the girl was at, finds a doll, sits with it, starts crying, and starts petting it. And next comes Helena to the rescue. And we find Charlotte has a dark past, but she won't say what it is. All she says is, I'm sorry. And that she believes that the spirits are punishing her for this dark past. Helena later on confronts Alistair about the earlier, uh, basically, um, possession. The earlier possession, which he doesn't remember. And he said both of them had dreams about witches in the summer house. Which, supposedly, that's what he was pointing to. And he doesn't know anything about what he said... And he starts freaking out and heavily denying that that he was doing it. And basically, I feel like he's saying, I don't know what I'm doing. We're way too over our heads. And I screwed up. I wish, you know, that's the feeling that he get Because, I mean, he went a octave high with his voice. And he just panicked. Then we get more generic music. And the group starts walking around. And then there's a song that starts playing. And uh, a Beltane song, which Beltane, it's the spring holiday. And it's believed that the horned god and basically the earth mother, this is the time of year that they mate because Beltane is a fertility holiday, basically. And so this song references the horned god a lot, which is the male spirit. And I think it doesn't have any place whatsoever to do with any of this other than it references a horned god so the the group enters the summer house and we see what the witch is left which is their altar which has a pentagram on it so they basically chuck with almost hatred that they they destroyed that altar and then underneath of it is another pentagram on the floorboard and alistair's like oh witches Bad witches. Basically, I mean, that was his... Then they start peeling back the floorboards to reveal... I'm I'm thinking... some. Uh, all we really see is, like, maggots or grubs. And they're all s- sort of pulled back because it smells horrible. I imagine something's dead. And then one guy's like, I see something. And so he plunt... Uh, Craig, uh, top head guy Craig, plunges his hand between the boards and pulls out a parcel with a large black stone in it then we go back to the camp and the crew discusses what it is like 
Could it be a lava rock? Could it be a UFO? Maybe a djinn? Then Alistair arrives to the greatest conclusion. He doesn't know what it is, but it's evil and, and is a black stone. And it's not from this place, but from somewhere else. Then we hear a voice say, come to me. And then the stone moves. Spooky. So Top Head, Top Head, so Top Head, Craig moves it with his bare hands, which, you know, if it's supposed to be evil, you want to touch it with your bare hands because nothing ever bad happens that way, ever. And then something happens and no one else is around. Then he runs into... Then Craig freaks out and starts running around and he runs to a bloody hanging body. Uh, and then the, the body twitches. And then next we see a woman or slash she's like dressed up like a maid crying over the bloody corpse or crying over a bloody corpse. Everyone cries out Craig's name as he wakes up. Then we have more exterior shots of uh, the manor and Alistair saying, I don't know what is going on, but I had to be... Alistair saying, I don't know what is going on, but it had to be a message. As Alistair goes for a walk, Tony says, it's Alistair's fault. Next, Alistair is drinking and fighting with a ghostly voice. And Alistair is like, don't mess with me. The I'm powerful. I know what I'm doing. And the ghostly voice keeps saying, Death awaits, and I am. I am beneath you. Then it calls Alistair a fraud. Then Alistair just starts screaming, Who's there? And then we see that the camera focuses on a wall, and then we hear Alistair scream, and then the crew finds him bloody and slightly mad, but somehow convinces everyone but Tony to stay. Then Tony goes to the campsite where the witch leader is, and they get into a fight. Then Tony wakes up, and some some guy comes charging at him, and he runs into the woods as the not witch cult hunter chases him to a lake where Tony goes for a nice dip. And then Tony's body appears in the middle of the room, dead and wet, and the crew panic. Then Craig volunteers to go to town to get goes to town to get the cops, but he gets sidetracked to beat somebody up. We hear screaming and see Craig bloody as he pulls out uh, as he pulls out a syringe and a woman coughing up blood. Then Helena hears the voice and she goes to investigate. He's, she sees the random the random towny bloke who leads her to a room down some stairs, then darkness. Helena panicking about being claustrophobic. Then the man taunts her, and then we are back to Alistair and Charlotte are panicking and splitting up to find them. Then the man taunts Helena, and then we are back to Alistair and Charlotte who are panicking, and then they decide to split up. Now we get Alistair screaming for everyone as he runs and walks around in the la for the last five minutes. Then we hear the voice that says, Death awaits. And Alistair is eaten up by some ivy and a figure walks by and goes, Okay then. And then a the tarantula makes another appearance that crawls all over Alistair's face. The screen cuts to black and we hear Alistair scream. And now we have Charlotte. And the random towny bloke come in and is holding the stone, which we assume she he smashes uh, Charlotte's skull with. And we we see the random bloke petting the stone. And then we also then we see the like the non witch witch cult leader, because I think is uh, taking other forms. The spirit's taking other forms. Uh, walking around, and he hears the voice, and says, I am, at the bloke, and then, oh, okay. And then we see the witch cult leader walking around, 
trying to figure out what is going on, and he hears the voice. It says, I am, at the bloke. And then another guy runs out as the witch guy, follows him, and then he hits him with a with some wood and bashes his head in with a stone. And then we see and hear the crew pleading and crying to be let out. The doors slam closed, and we do some more wood shots, and the narrator closes with, The sun once again casts its lights upon the dark moon. The earth turned, and all those upon it continued as they had before, but something had indeed changed. The spirits from within had emerged, like the days of old, and man had been given a message, but would it be listened to? The message is, I am within you. And then the screen goes black, and we have the credits, and I say, screw you. All right. I give this movie a point five. I think this is the lowest score I've ever given a movie, ever. This is definitely one of those, what am I watching movies? The film is all over the place. Uh, we don't know anything about the characters. There's no character development. What there is, you're not sure. It seems like it come out with one idea, then it switches over to another. There's no narrative to whatsoever what it is. It's cut up between music video-like shooting with documentary-like shooting of nothing. Even the end of the film doesn't make any bloody sense. Instead of using uh, stone references, it should have don't screw with magic or, you know, the message really should have been don't screw with magic if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, or, you know, don't screw around with spirits if you don't know what you're doing. And I have so many questions of why Lord Byron? What was the stone about? What was up with the last narrative? Because it sounds like you open Pandora's box. Well, Pandora's box has been open thousands of years ago, if you believe, you know, the, the legends. There is no more Pandora's box. Also, the music was all over from generic instrumental to word-like, pop-like songs. And the belting song got really on my nerves because it was the wrong reference for the wrong thing. Um... And like I said, the only the only reason I think they used it because it had a horn god horn god reference. There was too much walking and nothing of interest in those shots. Honestly, in order for me to keep interest in this film, I took breaks to watch YouTube videos or just do something else other than watch this movie. And I came back to it because I wanted to give you guys a review on this movie because I started it. I started taking my notes on it. And my point was to find one of the bottom of the barrel movies and I think I found it. Um, but this movie bored me so much. This is a waste of time unless you have insomnia. Then it would be, then it would help be great for that. I'm more interested in the estate than any other part of the movie. And I sort of want... And I sort of want references to what they were saying, what those experts, quote unquote, were saying about like the meteoroids and stuff like that, because I mean, it just—it sounded like a whole bunch of humble mumbo jumbo to me. I felt like the director wanted to make a new age film, but doesn't understand new the new age he calls religions. But you know, I did like, but it works if you go with the narrative that the spirit does say that Alistair is a fraud. And, I mean, that's fine with the word of the, the mumbo-jumbo wording. I'm okay with that, but seriously, like that belt, I would have given it more of a pass if it wasn't for that belt song. Um, and, like, the dark parts were far too hard to follow because of the filter that they used. And if you're going to do night shots, do night shots. Don't do... I mean, do night or day shots. Like, don't use a filter. Um, and I would say this movie is hardly horror. If anything, it's a moral story of don't screw around with things you don't know. And like I said from at the beginning, this movie had far more walking than I felt that the Lord of the Rings movie had. At least with the Lord of the Rings movie, it broke up walking in the movie. This one's just like, we're going to watch these people walk around.
so many th- little things could have been avoided in this movie, such as the the, uh, the the coven going to the group and saying, hey, we're going to do a protection spell, don't screw around with it. Or we see we're on sort of the same page. I mean, I don't know. Or even just... I mean, bulk at Tony, not freak out. Because whatever they were doing, then they destroyed whatever they were doing too. If you, you know, well, again, if you believe in magic, then they destroyed everything and actually hurt more than not. And there was no references to stones except for that black stone, which we could assume is a meteorite, and which we could assume at the end that that's what they were imprisoned in. But I mean, I don't understand the Lord Byron reference other than it was just some famous person reference. It had nothing to do with, oh, this is the most haunted place in the UK. I wish there was more spirits than what they did. Because it didn't make any bloody sense to ha- to say that. Uh, so, and then the question of, did the chapel turn into the spring house later on through the movie? Because, let's mention the chapel, but never do anything about it. But supposedly the spring house is this, or summer kitchen, or whatever, which is too small to be a summer kitchen, um, is the center of everything. I, I don't understand any of the direction of this film. Um, unfortunately, it's almost three hours of my time. I never will get, get back, unfortunately, watching this. Uh, again, if you want to watch it, it's on Prime. You have a Prime account. It's up to you. You've been warned. Thank you for listening. Uh, next month we will be doing our uh, our little uh, review of independent horror. And uh, Crazy Susie should be back. And we hope to get a stream up soon too. Or either it's already been posted and you can watch it on YouTube. Or we will be doing it soon. Alright. Uh, well, we'll uh, I'll spook you later. Bye.